Hello, the August edition of the Nutritionist Webinar 2016. I'm Marianne Fezenden from Agricultural Modeling and Training Systems, and I serve as your English language host. The webinars provide access to technical seminars by internationally recognized speakers. The six presentations are held in English, Portuguese, and Spanish. The printers are hosted by AMTS in the United States, while Marcel Hentz Ramos from Thrar Lab simultaneously translates into Portuguese for Brazil and Paula Rilo translates into Spanish for Argentina. There will be a post-presentation question and answer period during which listeners can submit questions through me or Marcelo and Paula. This, um, this month we actually have Tom Tulu down in Brazil with Marcelo, so this should be very interesting. A complete recording of archived webinars as well as a question and answer session for each will be available on the 3R and AMT 3R Lab and AMTS websites when Marianne gets them edited. Let's see. Second. Forgot what there we go. To edit this part out. Um, we are very pleased and honored to have Dr. Charlie Sniffen here today. Charlie received his PhD from the University of Kentucky in Ruminant Nutrition. He is president of Fencrest, a consulting firm for the dairy industry. Prior to his present employ employment, Charlie was president of Minor Agricultural Research Institute, professor and Meadows Endowed Chair in Dairy Management at Michigan State University, professor at Cornell University, and professor at University of Maine. He and his wife, Judy, reside in Holderness, New Hampshire. They have two daughters, Sarah and Kathy, and four grandchildren. Dr. Sin is a member of the American Society of Animal Science, the American Dairy Science Association, and the Northeast Ag and Feed Alliance. Today, Charlie will present on optimizing rations for transition and lactating cows based on fermentable carbohydrates. I'll turn the presentation over to Charlie and unmute him. So it should be open. Why don't you test that? Okay. And I'll... Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Start or what? Yes, let, um, you, I will progress to the first slide, but I'm doing it through your screen. I'm okay, in charge of everything now. now. Okay, so I need to uh, bring this up a little bit. <clears throat> well, welcome, everybody. Uh, about an area which we're evolving in, and that is formulating rations based on fermentable carbohydrates. It'll take a while to get my fingers on this. But uh, hopefully the end of it, I'll be in good shape. <clears throat> so we have historically formulated rations uh, based on NEL and crude protein. We are now formulating rations based on metabolizable energy and metabolizable protein. We have been formulating for rumen degradable protein and rumen uh, bypass protein. Of course, we have been formulating for the amount of fiber or forage, minerals and vitamins. Uh, uh, in the mesh. We are now using C the CNCPS model 6.5.5, which is from Rumen Dynamics. The feed analysis needed for this model is very extensive compared to the old days. No formulate for amino acids, starch, fatty acids, and of course, minerals and, and vitamins. We mainly formulated for NDF. Physically effective NDF, starch, and sugar. With the analysis 
that we now have available, we are now formulating for fermentable carbohydrate fractions, or at least some of us are. And uh, this area is complicated and so controversial because of, of assays and, and the uh, requirements for fermentable carbohydrate fractions. Now, a little bit of history here. This is a slide from Meredith Hall originally. And in the two carbohydrates in the diet, you have the plant cell contents and the plant cell wall. And the cell wall uh, contains pectins and hemicellulose and cellulose. And what I don't show here is the lignin, but the AF is made up of lignin and cellulose. These are the available, potentially available carbohydrates. And the NDF has uh, the semicellulose, cellulose, and, and, of course, the fiber. And this is called the insoluble fiber. Then we move over to the other side. And with the detergent system, <clears throat> uh, we um, solize the pectins, which, by the way, in the human nutrition uh, fiber, these stay with the, uh, the hemicellulose and cellulose. But in ruminant nutrition, we have uh, separated or solubilized the pectins and beta glucans. And they're the fruit the fructans and the starches, the sugars, and the organic acids that are in the cell contents. And this is either SC or NFC. A little bit of history here. This goes back to Meredith Hall's work uh, uh, <clears throat> when she was in Florida. And those, the fermenting pH. In the room. If you're looking at NDF only, that was an in vitro study, but a, a very interesting classical study, uh, uh, the pH remains pretty high. It put sucrose with the NDF, it's the pH. And there's not much difference between that and putting in pectin. But if you're in the starch, the core starch, it drops it lower. We'll see more, more. Uh, uh, examples of that as we go forward. Now, this is a, a, a follow-up on uh, Mary Beth's work, the same work, and probial protein yield. And we'll be getting into this later in the discussion. The, <clears throat> as you see, from, uh, the fire just NDF only, I um, do not get much microbial yield, and there's kind of a long lag as that fiber is, is digested in the rumen. Um, you have the NDF and pectin, uh, or, uh, excuse me, the NDF and sugars, uh, get, uh, you get uh, uh, an increase in yield. And the uh, um, F and pectin, you get a little bit higher yield, but from a microbial standpoint and a yield standpoint, uh, um, the best yield comes out, out of uh, uh, with the starch. So <clears throat> this is a, a uh, kind of a feel for some of the dynamics as, as we put together the various fractions of, of fermented carbohydrates. That's a little different approach, and this is. Uh, uh, Done, uh, Randy Shaver out of the University of Wisconsin, who's worked a lot in this area. And rumen fermentable organic uh, uh, matter intake goes up in kilograms per day. Um, <clears throat> the uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, time per kilogram of organic matter uh, uh, goes up kind of understandable because here you're having a lot of fiber and as you move out to the right there's going to be less fiber. Okay. Now this is taking the data in a, bit, a little bit of a different way. As you move up in the room with fermentable organic matter intake, the flow doesn't really change. Acid production does, so we get into a situation which is going to drop the rumen pH. Uh, 
done by Alex Bach, who has done some really nice stuff over the last several years. And it goes in a nice dynamic way <clears throat> as you have a high amount of forage in the ration, you're seeing a predomination of the cellulitic flora. As you move starch and, and um, um, other carbohydrates into the room, and um, you then bring on the amylotic, uh, uh, amylotic uh, uh, flora. And as you move more and more starch into the ration, um, you the lactosilylate begin to predominate. And um, and and uh, you can see what is happening, and then this increases then uh, with the lactic acid production. As you see the changes in the in the in the pattern of the fermentation acids. Another slide by uh, Alex Bach: a step-by-step microbial mechanism of the occurrence of acidosis in in, in the rumen. So we move then uh, to uh, more material growth, ruin the age begins to drop. You've got the lactating, uh, lactate producing bacteria, strip, uh, mainly Streptococcus strip bovis. And then move forward, you get some decoxifying action of uh, Megastrelis NEI and S. ruminantium. And uh, this helps alleviate, uh, they uh, uh, break down the lactic acid. How this can get overwhelmed as you move forward, and the growth rate uh, severe, uh, of, of several bacterial species has declined, and activities are declining, and act, uh, action of lactating utilization bacteria. So when you go then to the final sequence. You move into <clears throat> acidosis. Lactic lactate starts to form, and this actually has been related to problems uh, with with uh, uh, feed and of cattle. Approach on this. Another slide by <clears throat> Alex. Showing uh, the res as uh, on intake. You have uh, uh, um, when frequency is high, and uh, you're pretty even, the pH will be uh, holding pretty well. If and and, and that re room and pH remains high, intervals between meals increase. Uh, you're, you're in a situation where room and pH uh, is lower, and remains lower even after a meal. Way of looking at things. This is uh, done by uh, 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 Nina uh, Kaiser, and, and uh, she shows here uh, the percentage of cows <clears throat> at a feed bunk. And it's uh, it goes pretty low, obviously, at, to zero at milking, and then there's an increased frequency here at milking that drops to zero, but you have different feeding. Throughout the day, and, and then we assume in our models, current in the models that are available to us, we assume the cows are eating 24 meals a day. That different uh, kind of brings your mind to this a little bit. Uh, primary acetate fermentation. Uh, uh, you uh, a response in milk, response to fat, a little slight drop. Uh, uh, protein and increase in lactose. Obviously, if you're you're getting a uh, uh, increase in milk, you're getting an increase in lactose. Propionate, uh, your your uh, percent act goes down. Protein actually goes up. Lactose goes up. Butyrate uh, gives a very nice uh, um, uh, uh, response. So we use acetate and butyrate 
very plus for for milk fat, and that's called called uh, milk fat synthesis. Those are the two primary fatty uh, acids that are absorbed from the rumen that promote the milk fat uh, synthesis. And there's some really good work going on at Minor Institute in this area right now, as uh, well as into the northeastern part of the, of the U.S. here. And then uh, uh, plus and plus here. Now, to infuse glucose into the small intestine, <clears throat> you can increase in milk production, but a, a, a no response, as a matter of fact, a negative response on protein. And go to the amino acids, uh, uh, the, uh, you get a positive response on milk, a negative, and a plus on protein. So you can kind of see that then. This is preformed fatty acids here uh, uh, with the uh, 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 and, and, and milk, milk yield as well as the other. in room with pH among individual cows. 13 of the 16 cows in this particular study uh, experienced a pH drop below 5.8 for, uh, for some portion of the day, and you can see this. It all, and we assume all cows are responding the same. So then brings into the whole concept of what you're looking at when you walk into a dairy bar as to uh, overcrowding, uh, uh, various environmental situations that you have to pay to, uh, attention to when you're formulating um, um, rations. From uh, uh, Karen, and that is it shows the pH dropping more with high moisture shell corn than with dried corn, okay? And uh, uh, just, again, saying, okay, there's differences in fermentability among the uh, 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 different feeds. So I'm going to move into some on the fermentation of fibers. We have labs doing NDF digestibility by in vitro methods. There are issues in standardization of the in vitro procedures. Uh, <clears throat> there have been NIR equations developed with high predictability. The assays, and this is uh, uh, historical as well as current, but uh, the in vitro assays have measured 12-hour, 24-hour, 30-hour, and 40-hour digestibilities. The 4 and 30-hour measurements have been really the most commonly used um, um, in recent years. Uh, the new fiber system, point 0.1 and 6.5. And fiber digestibility based on measuring NDF at 30 hours, 120, and 240 hours of in vitro digestibility. The 240 hour is the new estimate of the indigestible or UNDF fiber. It is not constant. It varies amongst forages and with forages, and this will, going into the future, replace lignin times 2.4. This is a better predictor, and I've been involved in some other studies which kind of confirm this. Not uh, kind of. It does confirm that 240 hours seems to be a good, good measurement. A null that predicts the digestion rate of one in two pools in 6.1, 6.5, it will be one pool estimate, and that's a weighted estimate, a, a combination of, of a fast pool and a slow pool. But this new digestibility will be closer to the truth and will come closer to the forages we are feeding and what the cows are telling you. Uh, some work that goes back uh, a couple of years now uh, out of Cornell. Uh, <clears throat> and what this shows is three fractions. Uh, the the uh, UNDF, which is there, and you can see looking amongst the different forages, there's quite a difference in UNDF. You have 
a fast food, which is the P, potentially digestible NDF, one, okay, the fast food, and then slower pool, which is uh, um, the, the PNDF2, and this is uh, what I characterize as the slow pool. If you look at conventional corn knowledge as an example, the NDF is a little bit higher. Now, here to over here, which is lower in the BR, and the, the slow pool digests at a very low rate, and this is a little bit higher in the BMR. If you'll notice now, the digestibility of this fast pool is a KD of 7.3% per hour and rate of digestion of 8.7 for the, for the BMR. So this, this disappears pretty quick, and we see this when we need it because you usually get an increase in dry matter intake. And part of this is, is low pool plus the UDF. Um, <clears throat> Uh, is is a potential estimate of uh, uh, of the uh, gut fill, if you will, and we are still in the art and the discussion stage whether just UNDF or UNDF plus the slow pool might be, make a part of that. Now, notice that grasses has a fairly high uh, digestibility of the uh, of the potential uh, digestible fiber or the fast pool, and the slow pool here is. Uh, uh, has a, a slower in a digestibility, and it has a little higher in, in UAF. So when we need effective fiber, uh, many times we need to increase some uh, 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 some grasses in the ration. So they go over here to straws and hays, of course, a very high UNDF, low, and, and the keys even on the available fiber is low when you compare across. Now, alfalfa is an interesting one. This alfalfa, has a very high UNDF, a very small slow pool, but a very fast degrading fast pool. And it's basically what we see with alfalfa. Interestingly enough, they are now have bred a new uh, variety of alfalfa, which is reducing, and I don't know by how much, I can't tell you offhand, uh, reducing this UNDF uh, 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 percentage by quite a bit. So I'll bring in some interesting results with uh, alfalfa. So the change in, in forage NDF rate of passage with the 6.5.5, which is the model we're currently using, uh, the rate of passage was basically reduced by about 50%. This resulted in a significant increase in the amount of fiber digested in the room in the results. Uh, with an increase in about two to three egg cows of metabolizable energy and 150 to uh, 300 grams more metabolizable protein from the micro from microbial protein, with quality protein. With organizations of rations, uh, a higher percent forage in the ration and a potential exceeding the root fill uh, uh, and reducing dry matter intake. So now we're paying attention to this aspect of, of uh, getting into gut fill issues from a totally different perspective. So the fiber system in CMCPS 7.0, which hopefully we'll see next year sometime, uh, uh, same in vitro digestion and same model, there will be fast and slow pools. Uh, we'll, uh, there will be a fast pool and a slow pool rather than just uh, the one pool, and then there will be revised predictions of passage rates for forages, and based on the work uh, on now uh, on particle size as well, this will result in the ability to better predict true performance for forages, fiber needed for rumination, and maximum to produce uh, to predict rumen fill or when dry matter intake uh, uh, decreases. When rates, uh, form, uh, ration programs using 6.5, we formulate 55% forage rations. With the new model, the 6.5, we can be formulating 55 to 70% forage rations. We now need to consider UMDF 30 and UMDF 240, and I think uh, forward, it's going to be somewhere in the combination of these two. This puts emphasis on providing enough ammonia to the fiber bacteria's needs, because 
because you have more fiber, and that's a primary need for fiber digestion, as well as some of the branch chain amino acids and sugars. Fungi. So, being fed to uh, uh, house, starch is the next major fermentable carbohydrate source. The historically formulated ration is just uh, just starch uh, uh, amount in the ration, and we're comfortable with that. With the availability of seven-hour starch assay, we have begun to formulate for fermentable starch. Now, those, we go back into a little bit of history again. Uh, Randy Shaver um, introduced the concepts, and I remember this well at, at the Cornell Nutrition Conference in 2002, and uh, this concept called vitreousness. I couldn't hardly even spell it, let alone say the word, uh, back in those days when I first heard about this. But the point here is, in, is the availability of uh, the starch, the percent of the starch that is available. And he was pointing out, and this is, by the way, whole track uh, uh, starch availability, not just rural digestibility. But um, at any rate, as the vigorousness increased, the ability of the starch goes down. Okay? It is uh, a really important concept. Now, uh, Carlin Valley, who has done, in this case, and this was in 2008, 1,241 samples looking at corn silages. Uh, our ability, uh, uh, four millimeters, uh, uh, showed a tremendous variation in, in our, our corn silages, uh, from 50% uh, up to 90, with an average in, 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 in the 60 to 65 range. And we've historically been estimating a much higher level of ability than, than, than that in our, our book value. That's another concept. Um, this is a look at the available starch over time that uh, came into the laboratory. As you see, it kind of declines uh, uh, as you go into September, October, and November. Why, why so low in November? Well, it is measuring hundreds of samples, uh, still measuring residual samples that are from the previous year's crop. And as you move in, and the low point is when you're getting into the uh, the new crop corn silage in, in this region here. It takes until about March before you get into a plateau where uh, you're you're seeing the uh, it, the starch uh, uh, maximize in in, in, di in digestibility out, out of that corn silage. And knows that you can have variation amongst years. It just shows that <clears throat> there's differences uh, in, uh, between uh, one year and another, and this is absolutely true, and it depends on growing conditions. All there are significant hybrid differences in that type of thing. Now, there brings in another dynamic, and this is where we've got work to do because we're not quite there yet. And the work that Mike Allen at, at Michigan State has done, and he's done a lot of this work over many, many years in the starch area, just showing the rate of passage. And the inverse of that is the rumen retention time. How long does it stay in the rumen? And high moisture corn. Well, high moisture corn compared to dry ground corn, it's been for quite a while, for 14 hours. Whereas uh, uh, stays in a very short period of time, and the rate of passage and this is, is very, very high. And the rate of passage of the high moisture corn is quite low. Now, in comparison, then, of vitreous corn versus flowery corn, remember the previous slides. And vitreous corn has a very high rate of passage and a low rune retention time. The flowery uh, corn, this is in hybrids. Flowery corn um, uh, has a very low, relatively speaking, and this, by the way, was done in uh, cows producing uh, 40, 45 kilos of milk, okay? Uh, and so, in other words, uh, 
shepherds, hog producing cows, eating a lot of dry matter. So it uh, shows here that the rate of passage is low and the re rumen retention time is high. And this is uh, just another one uh, of two other studies. This was, uh, uh, this was in 2005 and 2008. What you see here is uh, a high rate of conversion, uh, a slower rate of passage for flowering, rate of passage, uh, slow rate of passage, and the, uh, the reciprocal of that of, of, uh, of vitreous corn staying in. So what you have here then is, is a situation of or just not going to get that digestibility of that starch in vitreous type corns or corns that fresh corns into the silo in the first few the first month or two after calf, okay? If you can get your head around that a little bit. Now bring this all together. Uh, <clears throat> for flowery hybrids, you have low dough. In other words, the, 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 the core doesn't sink. It's low density, and it's slow in passage, and it's very easy to grind. And it actually has a low bushel weight. The way out a bushel of corn. Uh, uh, and it has a low bushel weight. Okay, you go to a vitreous type corn. Um, this is uh, um, uh, the quality is low, low and high density, fast passage, and hard, hard, hard to grind. Now, this is the type of corn that we shift a very high, very flowery corn or low vitreousness corn. Uh, in shipping overseas or uh, when you're exporting corn, uh, it makes it very difficult for it to uh, maintain kernel integrity. So more of the, most of the corn that is shipped or goes into our feed mills is of the more vitreous variety, which means we need to do processing, do different kinds of processing. The real starch fermentation rate, the more uh, it escapes. The real starch is potentially less digested in the small intestine. The starch escapes to the hind gut, and some will be digested there, and the rest escapes. Okay, so that and this is the part that we really don't have a good handle on. We have total tract, post ruminal total tract starch digestibilities, but we do not have enough uh, differential on how much starch of, let's say, a vitreous corn that escapes is we digest it in the small intestine. It's going to be very, very uh, uh, important to know particle size and, and surface area at the, at the small intestine. Well, the, uh, the seven hour measurement the start and ha has been good for ranking, but not very sensitive for formulation purposes, unfortunately. Most of us currently have two hour and seven hour assays of soluble starch measurement. One of the labs has a subtle starch measurement. They actually, have also a two-hour one as well. At this point, the model can only handle one pool and one KD. Hopefully, we're there in the next year to improve that. I'm not a carbohydrate person, by the way. I'm a my thing is in amino acids, but I keep urging these carbohydrate gurus to move forward. I throw that in. The, uh, this uh, was done back in the 90s, actually, uh, by Dr. Uh, Bill Hoover and uh, his colleagues at his fermentation lab in West Virginia. And he did an enzyme approach, you know, a, a constant concentration of enzyme to add, add, add starch digestibility rather than the in vitro seven hour starch digestibility that I've shown you in the previous slides. And what goes here is if you if you look uh, at at whole corn, you can see that the digestibility is very very low. If you look at um, uh, the, the corn, for example, crimped, you'll see a little bit more of it is digested. Then you can look at uh, you know 
different levels of meal or, cor or corn grain, ground to different densities. Basically, it all kind of clusters. Just to now, when you move to uh, uh, you, uh, uh, the uh, start at flake, you see high rate of digestibility, but also notice right here, you're a two-hour area, and, and uh, 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 that then uh, shows that there is a fast pool and slow pool that out through 24 hours has a fairly constant rate. So, you know, two to three hour measurement or somewhere in there would be suggested in this. And I'd always hope we could go to an enzymatic approach, but we need to get more data in order to support that. So it can be divided into two components. Fast starch that disappears in two to three hours by enzymatic assay. 90 to 100% of it will be digested in the rumen. 100% of the starch that escapes fermentation will be digested in the small intestine. So you get the dynamics there. Slow starch, that starch that does not digest in the two to three hours will have a slow digestion rate, and the extent of digestion in the rumen and small intestine can be influenced. Particle size, shape, and density, source and type, sorghum, corn, and wheat, processing, steam flaking, steam rolling, and, and uh, um, uh, and other methods of, of, of processing. This is the spreading, uh, which is based actually again on Mike Allen's work and Mary Beth, uh, Mary Beth Deandres, who got her PhD with Mike Allen, developed equations and it got put into a spreadsheet. And uh, we adapted this early on uh, because we needed a way to estimate KD. So we put it into a spreadsheet, and unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your your point of view, it went viral, and uh, it's used quite widely. Uh, so, KDs, even though Dr. Allen, who first uh, supported that approach, then said, "Look, it's more complicated than that," and that's a slide that I showed you earlier. Uh, we should assume in the early versions of the model that 100% of the sugars and feeds were digestible in the rumen. This changed with the reintroduction of liquid passage. Uh, the earlier versions of the CNCPS, unless you go back to basically CNCPS 1 um, um, and CPM, uh, uh, there, uh, there was no, uh, uh, there was a liquid. Right, and they took it out. So it was reintroduced. That was a good thing because these are now in the 30 to 50 percent range. There's no say for rates, but you're getting a, an escape of about 20 to 30 percent of the sugars uh, that are fed to the cows. Okay. Cyber. In our model, it is still the residual. It's the Minus the individual VFAs, minus the starch, minus the sugar. We have other organic acids, but there is currently uh, there's no uh, commercial lab assay for that. We lab assays, obviously, for the individual VFAs, and and uh, those are included in, in in the model and their KD rates, et cetera, in, in digestibility. There are assumed KDs and KPs. Very little uh, measure. In, in that regard. Okay. So it's what what to balance for. Look at it in a in a, in a mentally uh, you're doing it simultaneously if you optimize. But um, in terms of the first balance, obviously dry matter intake, metabolizable energy, metabolizable protein, active NDF, and forage NDF. These are the things that we look at. And the non fiber carbohydrate and the peptides and ammonia uh, and the RDP as a percentage to dry matter. These are all the things that we kind of look at. Now, in the second balance, if you will, uh, a little bit more thinking a little bit differently, fermentable NDF, the lint, from, uh, starch, sugars, and soluble fiber, the fatty acids. 
and now paying much attention to the unsaturated fatty acids as well. Amino acids, uh, lean and then methionine and others. Okay, and in the recent uh, uh, presentations at JAM uh, 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 in Salt Lake City uh, a couple of weeks ago, much discussion of other amino acids being limiting. And then a final balance of minerals and vitamins. Regulation. The best approach is, and I'm slightly biased on this, the best approach is to use least cost optimization for the fermentable carbohydrate fractions. We can mins and maxes for each of the fermentable carbohydrate areas. This allows us to take into account the cost of providing the fermentable carbohydrates from each feed. Using optimization to formulate rations, we establish mins and maxes based on the environment. The concept the model that we use assume the cows eat 24 times a day and that each meal is equal. We, when cows are comfortable, they will eat 10 to 12 meals per day. If we, there will be uneven eating, then we will need to adjust rations accordingly. Here's some things uh, to think about. Um, Feed and maxes. Establish inventories and safe constraints for sensitive feeds. If four have mold, then we're going to do something a little bit differently. We're going to save space for minerals, vitamins, and additives. There are some tentative constraints. And I'm now focusing just on the close up and fresh cows. And so this is based on, it'll be on the next slide. But uh, fiber, the minimum 24% uh, uh, percent of the dry matter, max of 27, 13 and 17 for fresh cows. Okay, uh, and the starch, uh, 13 to 14, uh, and then 18 to 20 uh, on fresh cows. Sugars, two and a half to three and a half, four. Now remember, this is fermentable carbohydrate as, as a percentage. Now you've got to get, and get your head around this as to what translates into in total uh, total uh, components. Four to six and four to seven. Now, what do, what do we formulate for mins and maxes on UMDF uh, 30 or UMDF 240 is percentage of weight? Uh, cows, I don't have a clue. Work out of minor institute. Uh, uh, is 16 as a percentage of body weight, 0.35 to 0.40. Now, this is a question mark because the uh, work would suggest that that 0.40 is not correct. It may be 0.36 or 0.37, and this would move this down to a lower number for fresh cows, whereas for uh, producing cows, uh, this is a suggested level. I have no idea where we need to be as a percentage of body weight and we need to do some work on that, on UNDF. Now, based on uh, Mike Allen's work, he's recommending um, uh, 6 to 18 uh, starch uh, uh, in the close-up uh, ration. And fermentability of that, and a fermentable, uh, this is seven RNL, uh, 0.8 to 14.4. Fermentation. 25-27% starch in the ration. So percent notice a little lower fermentability in that early lactation cow in the first couple three weeks after uh, after uh, calving. 18 to 20, a low uh, number. Okay, cows uh, were move up to a much higher level and a high fermentability. Uh, this is when when cows have adjusted in the first four weeks or so. Uh, Post so then uh, uh, we can really move into a high fermentability uh, at this point in time, which is going to generate a lot of milk, and um, uh, there is a chance you have to be careful relative to maintaining the, uh, um, uh, so we can maintain milk fat. Of uh, lactation, then we're coming back. Okay, it's to do with body condition score control, and going to be dropping back on the fermentable uh, uh, starch. And lactation, we drop quite a ways back 
if you notice uh, uh, here, and down to a fermentability of 76. So we're at 23 to 25, 24 to 26. And here's where we have to pay more attention to make sure we're, especially late lactation cows that are obviously pregnant and uh, um, uh, metabolizable protein uh, uh, decreases, and you have to pay attention that you're meeting that MP. Now, this brings in the concept of different environments. Um, uh, this carbohydrate, uh, uh, the total MDF uh, um, uh, is, is, is in the range. In an average environment, you'll see that I have changed the numbers here. And, uh, and in a poor environment, uh, we're, we're dealing with uh, uh, different things, and the PE-MDF pretty much goes across here. And here's the fermentable MDF uh, down at the bottom. So environment, uh, uh, 9 to 11, 10 to 12, and 11 to 13. Well, why am I pushing it up to 11 to 13? Because as you remember from the early slides, uh, I had a... Uh, pH when I had a higher amount of fiber in it. If I have cows that are slug feeding, poor environment, uh, not good ventilation of the barn, I want to be not sitting on the edge. I want to be over in this region. And that's the, the, that's a concept, concept slide, and we need to do more work. That I'm actually involved in a very large study where we're taking a look at that very, very thing. Okay. Uh, so I'll get right to the uh, 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 fermented starch here and the concept of a poor environment where you're going to reduce that, that fermentable starch to average environment of 20 and to a good environment, you can go up to 22 to a 23. And, uh, um, and then the starch and sugars and, and this type of thing. So, in other words, we look at the environment the cows are in. You don't ignore it. And that's the concept there. Okay, I did some optimizations uh, with, uh, with AMTS. And uh, uh, notice uh, what I have uh, in, in this, the close up group. I uh, have uh, obviously the PEDF in the optimization. And in a 22 to a, a went to go to a 33, in other words, give it a window. And then the fermentable fiber uh, from uh, honey to uh, allowing it to go into max. And, and here's the formulation that I, that I actually got. Uh, full starch, I hit the, the max here. Wanted more, but I wasn't allowing it to go over 14%. Okay? And then uh, uh, the sugars, I was in uh, intermediate range and actually could have pushed a little bit more sugar in if, if uh, I needed, and then the fermentable fibers. So here's, just bring it into the optimization, and this is how I'm formulating. Okay? Oh. And again, our, the fermentation results are this. So the overall fermentable uh, carbohydrate is around 45 or 46 percent. And although MDF in the close-up group, and I've done a lot of looking at this, is generally speaking in the 24 in, in this particular case, but I, I see it up as high as 25, 26, 27. And then fermentable starch is, uh, in this case, 14 percent, and soluble fiber 4.1 and, and sugar 2.9. Okay. So this then uh, was the, what I was using for feeds, and these were the feeds that I was feeding. Uh, these, uh, these were the results. It was a uh, third pound uh, of dry matter intake. Sorry uh, for those of you who are in metric. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I optimized, and this is what came into the solution, okay? Uh, 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 so these are the... I said I didn't include do a, a decat. I could have done a decat, but I didn't do a decat in this, this solution. Would have actually.
actually, uh, but for, for this presentation, I, I didn't do a DCAT. Okay. True. Much has changed. Okay. So it's still uh, a PENDF of 21. And I'm at a 22 here, and a fermentable carbohydrate is a little bit higher, as you'll notice. Fermentable fiber drops down. This actually is a fairly good fermentable fiber. A lot of the numbers I'm looking at are in the 14 to 15 range. And the fermentable starch, uh, it's, it's over a little bit. And uh, then fermentable sugar. And uh, um, I'm looking for fermentable sugar over 4 because that will bring me over a 5%, uh, a 5 to 6% total sugar in the ration, and that's where we would like to be, and then the fermentable soluble fiber. And uh, so, again, I'm formulating for these. Now, in times, I, I started out this whole fermentable concept with uh, <clears throat> just formulating for fermentable carbohydrate. And uh, this was particularly important, I found out, uh, when using the linear formulation situation, not taking in some of the dynamics that it's best to get this because otherwise you got into situations of high bypass protein, and which was unnecessary. So here we have then this 47. See the <clears throat> NDF uh, fermentability total. You can kind of see where the pallulose comes from. Uh, and when it comes to the total, you see where most of it's coming from. You look at the start. Uh, most of the, the starch is coming from here with a look from the ground corn, and you know, it, it kind of gives you a profile uh, as, as you look and see where, where things are coming from and the percentages are. And uh, uh, that's uh, uh, a tool to look at when you're looking at it. So this is what the ration was that kind of came together, and, and I put my mins and maxes, and... Uh, um, and I was, uh, uh, in terms of, of, of what was being formulated for. So, uh, so uh, we need our assays for starch digestibility. We need for more than one pool. We need to account for particle size. For the rumen is relatively primitive uh, in passage digestion. It's a, a second order model. Uh, in reality, uh, according to Doc Cullen, and I think he's correct. Uh, and when I say digestion, I don't mean digestion in the rumen. I mean, uh, uh, well, digestion in the small intestine and then digestion also in the hind gut. Now, in 7.0, uh, we will have that capability of separating out not only what is digested in the rumen, but also the digestibility post rumly in the small intestine and then in the high gut. And that really is a big, will be a big step ahead. We need to better define a definition of the other carbohydrate fractions, sugars and soluble fiber fractions. That rather lightly, by the way, because we're at a kind of, in my opinion, at a relatively primitive stage in that one. So, the <clears throat> goal is to understand the group and formulate for the correct fermentation pattern based on temperature and humidity, the stocking rate, and so on. So, when you're walking, you look at all those things, and then we start to make a decision on where we need to formulate. And believe me, I showed you some concept slides, but we need to uh, uh, really, really work on getting relationships. And I've been doing some work, uh, meta-analysis type of work, where looking at uh, different environments and, and uh, different stages of lactation as to where you optimize the productivity optimize microbial yield and things like that, so, um, and, and control pH, and we're looking at some of that kind of stuff. We better understand the impact of E behavior and how to balance the carbohydrate fermentation.
conversation. Now, again, in 7.0, it's not, it's not a, a model, what we call a steady state model of uh, 24 meal a day. There will be uh, the ability to uh, for feeding behavior at a really beginning rate, but uh, that, that, that is, uh, that is uh, very good. So the bottom line, people, is we need to start balancing for metal carbohydrate fractions for replacements, cows, fresh cows, high groups, and low groups. And uh, dry cows, I mean early dry cows as well as uh, close-up dry cows, and replacements, when I say just generally replacements, I'm talking about any uh, replacements beyond pre-weaning uh, as we move through uh, their, their different stages of growth. So that, I turn it there, yeah. Thank you very much, Charlie. I'm going to take this. This is the last slide. I think so, too. Let me, um, I'll take the presentation ball back, and then okay. I will see. If there's one more slide, you're just going to have to keep on talking. Oh, I'll check. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Charlie, for that, that wonderful presentation. Um, before, and I want to say we had probably the most people who have ever signed up to listen to this, and quite a few attended live. I think a lot of times we get people signing up and hoping to catch it recorded if they don't have time for the live one. So it was really nice to see how many people wanted to listen to you speak. Um, Open the floor up for questions. I want to invite our listeners to attend the next webinar, which will be held on the 14th of September at 6 p.m. East Daylight Time, and that will be again on a Wednesday. We had some um, actually in Brazil, as I mentioned, and we had some conflicts with the Wednesday night session because of some talks that were being presented nutritionists there, so we switched it around. To Tuesday night, and I appreciate everybody making time in their schedule. The presenter will be Tom Taluki, who holds a PhD from Cornell University and is the CEO of AMTS. Tom's PhD work brought, about, brought forth major changes in the CNCPS model. Tom continues to contribute to the model development and is considered one of the very few primary global authorities on how it functions. To be speaking on advanced strategies, strategy for maximum, maximum production. Save the date and time, Wednesday, September 14th at 6 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. To thank our sponsors that helped make this webinar possible, Tom Taluki, AMTS, U.S. and Global, Marcos Neves Piera, University of of Lavras, and he is not joining us tonight, but usually he facilitates on the Brazilian side. Marcos Hans Ramos at 3R Lab in Brazil, who will be doing our facilitating. Paulo Torillo in Argentina, as well as our translators in each location. They are simultaneously translating it into Spanish and Portuguese. Our sponsors make it possible for us to get great speakers like Charlie and to manage the program. We thank our gold sponsor, Ajinomoto Heartland, superior nutrition through amino acids. Our silver sponsors are Arm & Hammer, Animal Nutrition, Virtus, makers of soda with EPA, DA Omega-3s, and Prequil with Omega-6s. Bronze sponsors are Jeffo, Life Made Easier, Dairy and Forge Laboratory, Dairy Laboratories, and Quality Liquid Feeds. We are beginning the planning process for the Nutritionist 2017. I already have a couple speakers lined up. I'm pretty excited about it. Email me if you have specific topics and speakers you would like to have cop, um, covered. I'm going to open the floor up to speakers or questions. Um, what we will do is, as usual, the English language people should ask questions in the Q&A window or that window, whichever they most readily find it, although sometimes I lose it in the chat window. And um, I ask Paula if she thinks she can speak, she can, or she will go ahead and type it in the question and answer. You may hear my voice excessively. So I go ahead and I've got a question already, and this is from Tom. So I think, let me see if there's anybody ahead of him. Gotta find my mouse. 
right. All right. So the first question is actually from Tom. Uh, you out a two-hour enzyme, but never seen that. Rather, people do two hours in vitro. Um, so how good is the number when we don't talk about lag in those early time points? The vitro measurement? Um, I think you were talking about the enzyme measurement. Tom will probably yeah. explain something quickly. Well, that was very, very early work, and, uh, you know, lag was not a part of that, and obviously lag is important. So, uh, um, uh, uh, but sure as heck showed the, uh, the dynamics and the differences amongst how corn is processed is, and, uh, um, uh, and you could use multiple time points with an enzymatic procedure. I mean, it was just MLA's, uh Dr. Hoover used in, in doing that work. Uh, but, yeah, it, was, uh, it, it include in our, in, in our concepts, and we don't have it in the current like it's instantaneously digestible. And then, of course, the soluble starch is probably has a very low lag time versus the, uh, 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 versus the insoluble starch, if I can characterize it that way. Okay. I have a question from Paula. I'm going to see if she can ask it, and if she can't, she will type it in for me. Go ahead, Paula. Paula? Hear Paula talking, so I'm going to ask oh her. But now I'll type it in. She's handled this before. It, it's, the the connection is sometimes spotty where where she is. Um, here it goes. Charlie, could you tell us your recommendations using milk, whey, and dairy rations, considering that all this CHO it has, consider the the carbohydrates it has, galactose, glucose, etc. The whey, the sugars and whey. Yeah. Um, what are your recommendations using milk, whey, and dairy rations? And that's from Carlos in Argentina. Yeah. <clears throat> that's really a, a good question. Uh, uh, I've done some work with uh, Steve Annual at QLF area, and uh, 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 off, uh, we. Uh, TDs on the on, on the sugars are low uh, relative to uh, say sugar uh, sucrose, uh, and uh, that's number one. And it, when we replace when and looking at uh, the meta analysis, actually this has been uh, uh, presented at some meetings, but <clears throat> meta analysis suggests that uh, you don't get over about. 20% of the total sugar complex uh, in, in a uh, uh, mix uh, in ration uh, because uh, uh, performance, this is no performance goes south. Okay. So, um, there's a continued question, and I have not taken the time, and I apologize for fine research that shows what the intestinal digestibility, if you have a, a KD of 30 to 35, uh, uh, on the lactose, in particular, the lactose, um, uh, more it's going to escape. Well, what is the intestinal digestibility of that? Now, the hind gut digestibility, but what is the small intestinal digestibility? And um, uh, the research uh, that has shown that it doesn't have a very high digestibility in the ruminant animal. Now, obviously, pre weaned does. So, and uh, okay. we got to be careful on the amount we put now as a percentage of dry matter, and that's what he's asking. I have to go back and look at <clears throat> that on a percentage of dry matter basis. And I'm doing it in a blend, in a, in a, in a molasses blend, if you will. Thanks, Charlie. Mm -hmm. um, There's a question from Bill Top, and he says, with all the different ways we have of processing grains, and since most farms only have one available, such as grinding or rolling, how do you change the ration on farm when it is changed, but you can't change the processing method? 
the question is, is how do we change? Uh, we've got one processing method for processing high moisture corn, or uh, on the if, farm, I'm assuming it's high moisture corn, right? Yeah, or whatever corn you're taking in. Or yeah, if you're bringing whole crop grain in, in other words, dried shell corn in to the farm. I guess a lot of dairies, that could be the case. Uh, you're going to process it in one way, although I, I would hastily add, if you're bringing uh, corn in and you're going to process it, one of the things I look at if a farm has uh, corn on hand and, and is doing the processing right there, the thing I look at is particle size. And it better be fine if it is a highly vitreous corn source. And most of it is that you you bring in on a farm. This is on farm now. Uh, if you're uh, steam, uh, you know, looking at high moisture corn, uh, then then uh, you're going to look at the moisture content of that corn and then process it accordingly. You're finer or coarser. How do you formulate against that? Well, the nice thing about it, if you can get a reasonable estimate, out of what you think the fermentability of the corn is on the farm, a fixed number, uh, an unvariable, hopefully, and uh, you will then formulate against that to an optimum fermentability of that starch that is being fed to the cows, depending on stage of location and, and that type of thing. And you just formulate to a right hand side. It's not the little starch in the ration. But it's fermentable starch as a percentage of the dry matter. That will move up and down depending on the base starch that you have on the farm, which, by the way, if you have corn silage on the farm, you've got corn silage starch and you've got the starch that you're purchasing that's coming in on the farm, be it steam pipe or what have you. Okay. Um, so I have a question from Paula, and this is from William in Peru. I see you consider many environmental factors in the model, but besides that, do you consider the internal animal factors? For example, a reason to maximize reproduction in cows, like finding a diet to promote a shorter freshening to um, breeding period. I like that question. Uh, answer for it. <laughs> But that's a darn good question. I really, uh, I think it's kind of a cool question. <laughs> um, um, I have to think about that for a minute. Um, but, I mean, if you're, you're talking about, I, I, I move back to the dry cows. And um, I want to make sure that I have right fermentations. Remember, uh, we're in a controlled energy type situation. The work out of the University of Illinois clearly shows you do not to exceed uh, by much uh, the uh, energy requirements of, of a cow in the dry period and then in the close-up period. You can move it up a little, but not a lot, and that seems to be relatively relevant. It is important uh, to insulin sensitivity and that type of thing. Then you move into the uh, lactate ration. You're into a area which is a little bit of a, uh, a, a hot spot right now, and that is the art that Mike Allen makes relative to controlling the, the fermentability of that starch and that uh, and the amount of starch, but the fermentability of that starch and that for three weeks postpartum. Because as a, if you have a lot of fermentable starch, and propionate is made, and it has a negative impact on dry matter intake, and um, that's the last thing you want. So his argument is still, and he just showed a series of papers at JAM this year that would like, view his his story, that um, um, we need to control that for the first two to three weeks post-calving. And on that, and what that does is allows maximum intake can come into energy balance sooner, and you're going to get those cows right back sooner. Okay. Um, Charlie, I'm going to circle back to that question earlier from Bill Top when he was asking about um, if you have 
different sources and you really should be grinding it different ways, but you're on the farm and you only have one one method. Um, he he said to follow up, so you would grind dry corn fine if a high corn silage ration. Is that what you would recommend? Yeah, if you have a high corn silage ration, uh, yeah, you'd want to do that. If it's dry corn. I mean, in other words, uh, you're buying in a load of corn. Uh, it's going to be pretty vitreous, and you want to grind it and, um, and, and, and to get as much of that available because you want much of that escaping uh, uh, room and fermentation, as Mike Allen has clearly shown. And, uh, yeah, uh, and then you formulate around that based on uh, the variability of the fermentable starch in the corn silage that you're feeding. Okay. Uh, question from Ed Vanderplegg, um, and he says, would you comment on how much fructose sugar, fructose glucose should be used as part of the sugar sources? Well, our on that uh, showed that uh, in terms of total sugar now, right? In, to in terms of total sugar, uh, <clears throat> which show that would uh, in the uh, uh, state range as a pretty matter. And, uh, uh, the data, and this is across many studies, the data would suggest that in the six to eight range. Now, if you go much over 8%, uh, things are going to go negative on you. Uh, but in the six to eight range, uh, root pH is okay, and and um, uh, you get an improvement in response. So, uh, that and right now, where to consider 100% of that being digested in the room, and you're going to have about 30 30% of that escaping fermentation. Question from Jose Alpizar: When we follow a guidance recommendation for fresh cows, such as carbohydrates, fiber, or protein fractions in diet in, in balancing, is there any relationship we should check to be sure the ration is, is um, has been well done or or parameters or by, or will following the parameters one by one be close enough? I'm not sure I read that very well. Let me if read I can... that. You see if I can suss that out a little bit better. Um, if we follow guidance, the guide, the recommendation guidelines for fresh cows, okay. things such as carbohydrates, fiber, or protein fractions, okay. is there a relationship you should check on to be sure the ration has been well done, or is following the parameters one by one enough? Uh, well, there. I mean. First, uh, uh, we're going to make sure that as best as we can within the predicted dry matter intake and the group of cows we're trying to feed, okay? I assume a reasonable environment around those cows. Uh, <clears throat> you're, you're going to uh, um, um, balance and meet the uh, energy requirement, and, the, and the, again, the argument is uh, we're going to do this. Oh, I optimize rations, and I put in mins and max in these different areas. And obviously, I'm balancing for amino acids as well as uh, um, uh, starch and sugars. And along the guidelines I pointed out, I didn't do anything on the protein side in this presentation today. But, but in fact, if you look closely, I'm going to meet the MPs. And I'm going to make sure that I have the right amino acids in there and the right, uh, and uh, uh, MEs and MPs. Um, recognizing, and of course, the question is: in transition period, how long are those cows in that in, in that uh, in that fresh, uh, fresh cow group? If in fact there is a fresh cow group, but if it's a fresh cow group, you ask the question: what are those cows leaving that group? What is the protocol that the dairy farmer is using? Because that will have an impact, and then the environment that surrounds those cows. Hope not over overstock. Um, this is a question from Paula in Argentina, and this is from William. Is it really useful to use protected urea to synchronize protein and carbohydrate degradation, or is it just a commercial justification? 
Ooh, careful. Um, I've been in there as well. And uh, uh, move into a, and, and there's a lot of areas here that we, have, that we haven't explored yet <laughs> that need to be re examined. Uh, because it's a, it's a darn good question. Uh, if you, all of the shows, if you put urea, urea is uh, really highly available, okay, and is rapidly available and doesn't synchronize with the carbohydrates. Now, if you looked at the, uh, uh, so data that I showed uh, uh, earlier uh, in this session, uh, you have a release rate. And to manage that, and at the same time, don't excess nitrogen uh, because get in now as we balance rations. Understand we're balancing rations now, not for 17 and 18 percent crude protein anymore. We're balancing rations for 15 and 16 percent, maybe lower, 14 to 15, 14 to 16 percent for high-producing cows and fresh cows, and so on. Um, is, is environmental reasons. This is no different people than the poultry or swine industry. They keep pushing the protein down. Well, all of a sudden you're into, just, uh, we were meeting all the amino acids before. As we reduce the amount of protein, uh, um, the amino acids become more important, can be, become limiting. So we need, we don't want a uh, uh, nitrogen waste. So Yes, I think that uh, a controlled release of uh, urea um, and, and it does have a place. Uh, but for sure, if we move into a lower amount of protein in the ration, we're going to need to look at that because we, we fed excess protein. And with says protein, you're going to probably meet the ammonia requirements of the bacteria. You're going to flood the system, and who cared if, how much of it went out in urine? Well, that, that changes, and yet we can't just charge urea in there and have pulses of urea. We need to have a control. Have we can work with low-protein rations? I don't mean much. Okay. Oh, um, Charlie, I have a follow-up from um, Ed Vanderplug about the – he was asking the question – about the sugars earlier, and he wondered how much of the sugar could be fructose specifically. Oh, uh, uh, rather than sucrose. Jeez. Uh, you know, I, 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 I think that's a darn good question. I'm going to think of some, of some of the data I've looked at relative to fructose and sucrose. And, um, one to one, one to one to one. I don't think. Uh, now I'm going back trying to think about uh, the work that Russell did in, in early years, uh, Jim Russell, um, and I'm trying to think. There were some differences between fructose and sucrose, and I just can't remember. And it's a it's a it's a good question, and I wish I could give you a specific answer. Uh, oh. uh, yeah. Right. There, sir. Yeah. yeah, we we can maybe get get that information to him. Yeah. Um, let's. This is from Paula, and this is again from William. What opinion about um, bypass fat used in fresh cows to regulate negative energy balance? The way I formulate rations, um, uh, I uh, try to minimize the use of bypass fat because it's, it's uh, expensive. And uh, uh, I, I just uh, uh, I don't have no problem with it. As a matter of fact, I think it's a fantastic ingredient. Uh, better than rumen available fats, which uh, causes uh, uh, issues in terms of milk fat synthesis. And uh, so it makes sense to me. And now, as you very well, Henry very well knows, and by fat now comes to a new diameter. One is, okay, what is the digestibility of that bypass fat? That's one. And then two, what is the fatty acid profile of that bypass fat? 
because there's now research shown out of the University of Florida and, and several other locations of the fact that profile is important. And uh, so <clears throat> that becomes uh, part of the issue relative to reproductive performance and, and other uh, metabolic consequences. So I think highly by that, and maybe we'll include it in more, more of our rations. So, uh, yeah, no, it, it has its place, that's for well, sure. And, and it's better talking. than having okay. room and available fat as, at the same level. And it meets the energy balance, and I use it, I put it into every ration. It is available for the, for the ration. And it's not like I exclude it. But given the price on, uh, uh, for example, I'm looking at an, an arm and hammer here. <laughs> uh, the, uh, um, um, hey, listen, uh, that is uh, um, it's a good product. As are some of the other bypass fats? And, uh, it makes uh, makes sense to use that. But remember, as you put more fat in, you're taking out fermentable carbohydrates potentially kind of reduce uh, the amount of microbial protein. So you just put it in for the sake of putting it in. You put it in to meet a energy requirement and also to meet, uh, uh, to meet now, meet some of the, the needs for visual fatty acids. And um, just to stop, just speaking about fat, we had um, time kins, uh a couple months ago, and and I'm working on getting that. I think I have that up recorded. I can't remember at this point. Yeah. I know I'm too behind. Um, Prokop and Vinberg are behind me. And we have Dave Barbano speaking in October. We'll be, he'll be looking at it from the viewpoint of um, milk fat and protein. So that may yeah, be the interesting one. Dave Barbano is really doing some real wonderful work with the people at Minor and, and also a, a, a big co-op there up there in Vermont. Uh, this whole area preformed and uh, preformed, and that's what he's asking is the preform. Stay tuned. Um, this is another question from William. He um, he sees in many of your formulas you use protected methionine. In which situ situations do you think it's most necessary? Well, uh, I've been involved in. <laughs> Two or three analysis in this area now. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the planning, uh, for the most part, I mean, first of uh, all, the close up uh, drug cow work uh, done at Illinois has probably put in some bypass methodology. Uh, it seems to really, really uh, have a response. Um, now, uh, uh, Rotation cows, yep, uh, and the high producing cows that uh, they say methionine is, is first limit. If you get methionine, then it depends on a number of other things to so what can be first limit, it being histidine or um, uh, one or two of the other amino acids, as well as lysine. Um, I, I, you know, I, I automatically, in, in rations that I'm doing what-if rations, I automatically bring in a, a lumen-protected uh, amino acid, uh, the thionine and lysine, et cetera, and, uh, to, uh, to let them, that price is to whether they're going to meet it. And the new, uh, with 6.55, I'll point out, the thionine still comes in. Team does and doesn't come in. Uh, depending on the quality of the forage and the amount of microbial yields you're getting. Okay. Um, a question, another question from Paula, and this is from Carlos, and it's um, about using whey and dairy rations. He, he um, let's see, whey inclusion, recommended levels in lactating cows, is it similar to that on replacement heifers? Uh, uh, let's define uh, uh, whey. Is it with the protein in it or whey without the protein? I think he'll get back to me on that. <laughs> a lot of the ways here in the United States now, they're pulling the protein out. 
Okay. Yeah, we'll put it in. Well, we're uh, there. So try to think of what they're doing in Argentina. I don't know. Yeah, and they said. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to assume they're they're doing the same thing we are, and that is pulling the protein out of the yes out of way. It is out protein yeah. in a way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so we're we're basically talking about lactose and and minerals and water, right? Okay, so the question was uh, for uh, replacements. Uh, the question was actually for is the level of lactating cows similar to that on replacement and heifers. Yeah, that's what I thought. Uh, oh, I just blow there. Uh, I don't have a clue. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, uh, let's think backward on this. Uh, uh, <clears throat> on a percentage of the dry matter that is in fed replacements, uh, Especially, uh, you know, 12 months up to uh, up to they come in. Uh, um, I would percentage basis, given that it's now a ruminant, uh, on a percentage basis, it would be about the same. Uh, sure, now we're not talking about milk, we're talking about gain. Um, uh, it would be close to the same, maybe, maybe a little less, I don't know. Yeah, I don't have an answer for that. But I haven't seen any control studies on feeding whey to replacements. Tom has, I have. Uh, maybe he'll he'll chime in. Yeah. Let's, um, let's see. This is just a follow up from um, Robert von Sahn. He's Ian Lean did some recent work and showed greater acidosis with fructose fed. Had 0.4% fructose and found lower rumen pH. And that from the Journal of Dairy Science, Golder et al. Oh, I missed that one. People with access to computers. <laughs> yeah, well, I won too, but I missed that anyway. Well, yeah, just Golder, during the, the whole thing. Uh, that would be, uh, that'd be uh, so that probably was a meta analysis out of uh, Australia. Okay, it was 0.4% per, of body weight. 0.4% of body weight. Yes. As, as uh, fructose. Yes. Interesting number. <laughs> uh -oh. Okay, I'm going to, I jumped ahead to that one so, so we wouldn't forget. Uh, this is from Eduardo in Uruguay. Consider pH variation during the day. Should we expect changes in bacteria population by species? By species? Well, the the bacteria population. Uh, in other words, a change in the microbiome. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. There is a lot of papers presented. Uh, well, there's some papers presented at uh, at during the summer in this area, and you do see some interesting changes in the microbiome as a relative to, actually others have shown that as well. I mean, the gross thing is, uh, you know, depending on how long you're down below 5.8, uh, 5.6 uh, pH in the room, and it's going to show what that microbiome looks like. No doubt about it. Yeah. Uh, lean study was done. Um as a re feeding trial to see the effects on the rumen. By oh, the yes. Recent tests? Uh, I can send you this whole thing. It's a um, Golder L JDS 2012. Oh, I have that on my computer somewhere. Anyway. Okay. okay. Um, let's, uh, this is, and what is your recommendation to avoid low pH peaks in cows? Pasturing on spring ryegrass with high sugar content. So, what pasture situation? Now? This is in Argentina where they often have pasture questions. Okay, well, I can understand that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, and the first okay. thing is, yeah, 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 I mean, you've got a very high sugar content, and, and it's uh, the experience is that we're underestimating the total amount of sugar that are in these pastures. 
an analytical standpoint, we may measure four or five or six percent when it actually is eight to ten percent sugar, and uh, um, and that's a lot of sugar. Uh, uh, so so uh, to uh, put into the thing is to what is the feeding pattern of those cows on pasture? Cows in off of pasture to uh, uh, to milk them. And you're going to feed them a, uh, a, a grain, if you will. And, um, uh, my experience when I've been in Australia on, on dairies, on pasture dairies, is uh, uh, cows don't necessarily, the last meal they've had may be uh, before midnight. And uh, maybe, depending on when the cows are brought in off pasture, uh, you can have uh, uh, a situation where they have not eaten a four, if you will, and, and or the uh, sugar in a while, and so then you uh, hit them with grain two times a day, the morning being a bigger one, and uh, you can really drive fluid pH down and, uh, because you don't have any, uh, it's, you know, like you used to do in, in when we feed cows in uh, conventional facilities, I'm sure they have a little forage for thing in the morning. And, uh, uh, so there's that part. And the total sugar amount uh, that you would put in the ration, you might want to put back as far as the grain that you are feeding or the total ration that you are formulating, uh, uh, closer to 6% of the total sugar, uh, uh, the sugar in the ration. Uh, the problem we have, people, is we go beyond our, our assay methodology is not very good. For sure. It says total sugars, and we should be looking at individual sugars. He's asking the same questions on, on sucrose and fructose and so on and so forth. And, uh, some of these sugars can be very positive and uh, on the negative side. So we need to be formulating for individual sugars, just like we're now formulating for individual amino acids rather than and crude protein to make a stark contrast. Okay. Um, so in regards to that question on the lactose or um, whey being said, said to replacements, Tom said he hadn't heard of anything. So yeah. um, that was to, to give you back up on not knowing or not yeah. having seen study. I am out of questions on my end. I don't see any more being at the window, um, think that, uh, oh, Paula has one more. She's in the process of reading it. She has to listen to it in Spanish, translate it to English that I, I might possibly understand so I can then <laughs> say it to you. It's, it's a complex, it's like telephone. Okay, here we go. From William. William's full of questions tonight. Um, and usually is one of our better questioners not possible for a nutritionist to formulate rations for dairy cows without a software like AMTS and well, without analyzing completely the ingredients. These analyses are more sophisticated than proximal analysis. In my country, Peru, it's still common to use proximal analysis. I'm not sure if that's a question or just a statement. Um, but all of might not have been done. I might have jumped the gun on that. Um, maybe have some to say about that. The fact of the matter is, uh, <laughs> the fact of the matter is, let's move uh, to here in the Northeast to do a lot of this, and I keep talking about all these measurements, right? But uh, out there in the real world, um, uh, some of us are still formulating on the simple analysis, and we depend on the master feed dictionary uh, to provide book that if you will, uh, understand and get an appreciation for um, uh, the, the variation in the forages that are being fed and the feeds that are being fed and how they differ and select the right ingredients, uh, book those, and then uh, you've got the proximate analysis that you're in the right direction. And we'll use, we use book values as the best, best we can. And gee, we still do a lot of that. I think Tom will confirm that. that um, all 
this, yeah, it's great if we can have all these analysis, but we don't. We depend on book values. So and you just you have to select the right ingredient, for example, corn silage. You don't have you have nothing more than food protein and the uh, uh, the NDF, let's say, and in, in the uh, corn silage, and maybe you have starch. Uh, but uh, uh, you say, okay, what is it? You can feel the stuff. You know what the dry matter is. You know where you, it came from. You know the time of the year. And you can select the right uh, closest you can uh, out of the Master Feed Dictionary in your way. And I don't care if it's NRC or uh, the NRC Dictionary or the um, AMTS Dictionary or the, or the Cornell Master Feed Dictionary. A lot of that. <laughs> I put it out like we're all doing all these fancy analysis. Well, I can tell you that that's not the truth. And I think in that case, William would be able to, if he can't get the analysis on the feeds, he can get the, the environment and he can get the animal. Um, that much he can get, get accurately. And that yeah. helps step the model along. Yeah. Um, this is a Question from Richard Basurto. In regards to methane production, can we expect a reduction in methane if we form it using fiber fractions, as you mentioned? It's an interesting question. Uh, uh, I used to measure in my early years research uh, methane production in cows. I actually had respiration calorimeters. And uh, uh, I for attrition is uh, the methane is about 10% of the gross energy. And as we moved into higher concentrate rations, uh, in the amount of forage being fed, we were in down to four to five percent. So um, now, as we're feeding, going to be feeding more, a little bit more forage if you have quality forages. Um, uh, that methane production is going to go up, so how can we mitigate it? Uh, gee whiz, uh, it's just been in the last, what, uh, four or five years with mega dollars coming from our federal government to various universities here in the United States. I don't know what it's like in other parts of the world. Uh, uh, there are all kinds of studies going on with various compounds they're getting to put into uh, the to mitigate it, but uh, there's also formulation you can do to, to mitigate it. And quite frankly, uh, in terms of how to formulate a ration to mitigate methane or reduce methane production, I don't know. Uh, we, we, in our studies, actually used a product called uh, oral methane, and um, it, it uh, did a nice job of knocking the methane down to zero, except we also measured the hydrogen, and it just went up. So if you uncouple one part of the uh, reduction to uh, methane from carbon dioxide to methane, and we just uh, uh, and the hydrogen went up. And I'm not sure many of them are measuring that as well as uh, just looking at methane reduction. Our game was increasing efficiency. And, hey, 10 percent gross energy. It'd be nice to get it down to one or two. Not have a uh, high output by the cows. So. so I am out of questions, Charlie. Um, um, somebody types in something quickly. Uh, while while I'm sort of waiting, I just want to, I've had a couple emails from people thanking um, Diana Allen and Ed Marfritas and Elena Bonfante all thanked and thought it was a great webinar as they Department. And so, some of those people that left are up until like I think it's midnight or later. Oh <laughs> so, gosh. Yeah. <laughs> well, it doesn't look like we have any more questions. I want to thank you so much, Charlie. It, it was yep. great to do this with you. These are always long for the presenter because you have to go from presenting to asking questions. Um, tell everybody. Make sure you tune back next next time. It'll be um, Tom and he'll be able to speak on more production optimizing. And Charlie, thank you for your contribution. Quick question, is it okay if we 
make the slides available as a PDF and send that out when we send oh, that recording. Oh, absolutely, no problem whatsoever. Okay. Uh, and and, and uh, if everybody can still hear or you, you can translate, uh, uh, if there are any, I, I assume uh, anybody has any additional questions they want to ask, uh, just shoot at them. I'd be glad to try to answer them. Uh, Paula, Paula wants to try to say goodbye if she can. <laughs> it's getting any better than it did earlier. Uh, well, it was last time, yesterday. Yeah, it's 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 not all delightful. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we okay. we can. Okay. I hope Tom's having a good time in Brazil. And and. And thank you again very much, Charlie. I'm going to sign okay. off for everybody. Oh, so I can hang up now? Yes, you can hang up. I'll get us out of here. So. Okay, bye-bye. Thanks.